Hello everyone, I'm your host Mariana and you're listening to A Degree Farther, the official podcast of the Graduate School at Hood College, where we feature current students, alumni and faculty who are innovators on our campus and in our community. Today we will talk about ChatGPT. We have two guests that are experts in this topic and they will explain to us a little bit more about what is it, how it works, how we can use it to improve our professional lives and well, maybe start to know how to adapt to this new virtual and artificial intelligence reality. I hope you like it and I hope it's very useful for you. Okay, first we are with Katrin Ryberg, who is a research librarian that teaches information literacy in FYS and other research focuses classes. She has been at Hood for five years and her interests include open education resources, misinformation and DEI issues at work. Outside of work, baking and glass art are her main diversions. And we are also with Dr. David Gorsik, who is an associate professor of management science at Hood College. He holds a bachelor degree in computer science from Frostburg State University, a master degree in computer science from Hood College, a PhD in information systems from the University of Maryland, and is a graduate of Harvard's business analytics program. Today, he leveraged his expertise to merge technology and business strategy in order to enable innovation and accelerate commercial success. Dr. Gersnick is particularly enthusiastic about the potential of generative AI, artificial intelligence, and large language models to revolutionize the way we interact with information and technology. He's committed to exploring the applications of these powerful tools to create new opportunities and change communication and improve decision-making process. I hope that everyone that is listening learns a lot from this episode. Don't forget to follow us and open the notification button. Thank you so much for being here. And here they are, Dr. David and Katrin. Enjoy it. Hello, Katrin and David. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm so happy to talk about ChatGPT today. I have to confess that I didn't know anything about this until um, I knew that I was going to interview you. So I'm so excited about knowing more about this. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so... Um, to begin, uh, I would like to ask a little bit about ChatGPT, like if you can explain and describe a little bit about what is ChatGPT for our listeners that maybe are how I was before. <laughs> sure. Catherine, would you like to, to begin or I can I can begin? I'll talk a little bit more from the technical side of the house. Okay, so... I have a short summary of it. Um, so ChatGPT um, takes in textual prompts and it an analyzes the current conversation to create a probability for all of the words in its vocabulary. And then it decides uh, what the most likely next word will be. So in other words, it has no understanding or learning or facts. It just has statistics to guide its speech and it can create plausible sounding sentences, but they may not be accurate or truthful. That's a great that's a great definition. So when we think of chat GPT, that's actually the, the front end by a company called OpenAI uh, to their language model, either GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. GPT stands for general purpose transformer. And in the AI world, when we pre-build models, instead of building them anew for every time we need to use them. We, we create them and then that model, the model is actually all the sets of weights internally, all the mathematics behind it can be used in very much a black box scenario. So we give inputs in and we get outputs as a result. The largest models like a GPT 3.5 or GPT 4 take a tremendous amount of computational resources and time to build. Now, when we think about chat GPT, it's kind of two versions right now. There's a, you register and everybody can use it version. That's the 3.5. Uh, by my understanding, that was built with an input 
of 175 billion parameters. You can imagine all of the different language elements that would come in to create that. GPT-4 steps it up a notch and has about a trillion parameters uh, input. Now, GPT-4 is a pretty interesting evolution of that large language model. So I call them LLMs, large language models, in that it's multimodal. We don't have access right now to that multimodal input, but presumably soon we will have access using chat GPT or perhaps other tools to both incorporating language, textual prompts as our input, but also visual uh, sound files, um, you know, perhaps even movies as inputs, other types of inputs that can come in. So I think we're on the cusp of something really exciting happening here. And I know here at Hood, we're already having really great conversations about chat GPT and the way that it's impacting both our students and their work in the classroom, but also their potential for careers and opportunities when they leave the campus walls. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. So. Um, so what I understand is this is a website that everybody can use, right? Is is for everybody? Yeah. Almost, right? Everybody can use it, but right now this is one of the fastest growing technologies. And so for my students, I, I say, hey, go take a look at this, and they'll tell me, oh, the site's unavailable. And that's a very common message I'm hearing, especially during working hours, because of the massive popularity of this particular site. Right. So I think you met, you mentioned chat GPT 3.5. So the interface is open access, but the training data set is not available to the public and chat GPT four, I think you have to pay for, um, I think it's $20 or something oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, to, to join and have access to that. So of course it's going to cut down on how many people are using it. Um, and I found that chat GPT, if you set up your account, it's real easy to get in. I use it like a bunch of times today and it worked fine. So. Oh, okay. And as much as we talk about the chat GPT interface through uh, the website, there's also a programmatic side of the house as well. So once you've created your account, whether it's pro or regular, you can have access to interact with that model, not just through the interface, but through your own code. And there are uh, opportunities to do that in some students already begun working in that area. Okay, that's crazy. So there's like levels of chat GPT. That's crazy because so that means not everybody have the access of the same information. Um yeah, well that that um guide me to the next question that is from your perspective as a research librarian, like what do you think that are the positive and negative? factors of GPT. Yeah. So in terms of positives, um, for research, I think it can be really useful for brainstorming purposes. Um, it can be asked to generate search terms for a particular topic. So I tried it out. I used Black maternal health as my topic, and it came up with a lot of good suggestions that I could use for searching databases. Um, and it also can be useful to put together like some initial ideas. If you're really struggling to start a project or a paper, um, it comes up with good project ideas. Um, and it, although in general, I think it's better at creating quantity rather than quality. Um, I think in the future, if it's used properly, it could provide feedback to improve student writing and reasoning. And ChatGPT could also create more opportunities for diversity and equity in research by removing language barriers that would allow researchers to write really excellent top notch articles. So I'll take a stab at this. I'm an internet technologist. And so I, I kind of came of age at the, the birth of the internet through my, through my early uh, uh, educational days and, and went off and did my doctoral work as social media was, was coming of age. And what, what these large language models feel like to me is that beginning of the internet where there are lots of little issues, certainly with this. I think everybody can see the tremendous possibility behind these tools. And as I mentioned, right, these are 
fast moving. It's amazing how quickly organizations are starting to integrate them into their standard tool sets. I think we look no further than Microsoft, who just a few weeks ago announced Office Pilot, which is their full integration of chat GPT into the Office suite of products. I, I tend to think that these are going to evolve very quickly. Um, we've already seen a tremendous pace of, of increase. And I, I think that they're going to do a couple of things. I think that we're going to begin to utilize these almost as we used to, as we began to use search interfaces, that these will just become very common, uh, ubiquitous in usage across different apps. And as much, of course, as we talk about chat GPT, every major company out there has their own whether it's Amazon's Lex or Google's Bar or Facebook's Llama, Baidu has uh, uh, an LLM. There's Stanford now has versions of LLMs. There's lots of these that are, are, are coming online. These are going to become common. And so what I think is going to happen is something a little interesting. I think that as we use these tools to generate really large amounts of text, right, that quantity, and over time, of course, they'll get better and better at that, certainly bring in different types of, of, of material to better the responses that they give. Um, I think what it's going to do is it's going to devalue text communications. And I say that by looking at some examples already. Uh, Microsoft has a, a program called Viva Sales. It's their uh, CRM software that allows, uh, that supports folks in a sales role with keeping track of the, the clients that they have, uh, interacting with them, and kind of all storing that in a repository that other individuals in the company uh, with appropriate access can leverage. Think you know, other salespeople supporting those same clients. And their model showed that they could uh, get a, a prompt in from an individual, uh, say they want to know about a particular product. Well, the Viva Sales pulls up an email, auto-populates that email, pulls in pricing information from another spreadsheet, and presents it all to the agent who can then say yes or no, or do some tweaks in between. But what I think is important is to think about that text that's coming in. As we're all able to generate really well-defined text, and a lot of it very quickly, take out the drudgery of, of, of textual communication, it's going to become so commonplace that we're going to now have every expectation that the text that we send out is going to be processed and read through by other large language models. So we've tried doing this in the business world for years, trying to get communication between different applications, between different systems, especially uh, what we would call disparate systems, the systems that aren't on the same platform. We've tried all sorts of different methods over the years. XML being a great example of a, of a format that was meant to seamlessly provide information from one system to another. We didn't, didn't meet that purpose that we had because XML got really complicated. All of these other techniques got really complicated and you couldn't inject yourself into the middle and understand what was going on. But here, now that we're using natural language as the lingua franca of communication between systems and that we as individuals can interject at any point in that dialogue, I think we're going to start to see that systems are going to use these very verbose methods to interact with one another. And our conversation will just be a small part of that larger conversation that our technologies are going to have in supporting the work that we do. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> I am like, Whoa. um, because what I understand that you're saying is that the the big impact of this chat GPT is that is like because it's an artificial intelligence is actually responding as a human. So now it's not only two systems connecting; it's like two systems that connect as humans. Is that right? Uh, it's still a machine and it still doesn't have understanding. I mean, it has, I mean, and it also, it will perpetrate biases. It doesn't have 
creativity very it doesn't have it's not very good at creative tasks I don't think from what I've seen and what I've read about so uh, it's important to understand its limitations and really you know keep that in mind and also think about you know when it produces something who's responsible because it could be making healthcare decisions for people down the line what if it makes a bad one and somebody gets hurt or dies who's responsible chat gpt open ai it can't be those those aren't you know chat gpt is a machine so there's some issues with anthropomorphizing chat gpt too much Catherine, I really want to pick up on a, a term that you used before, which is predicting the next word. And, and that truly is the basis for, for what these machines do. But we have to remember where they're at now and, and recognize kind of where we're going here. AI is being infused in everything and through different types of models, right, starting to showcase some really powerful capabilities in areas that were once thought to be off guard to uh, AI systems. And so in, in a lot of the, the research that looks at how industries react to incumbents, whether it's new companies coming into the area or whether it's new technologies coming into the area, it seems like the response is almost pathologically the same. It's that the company that's in the space prior to kind of doubles down on efficiency. Uh, one of the earliest um, industries in New England was the cutting and shipping of ice. And they would ship that all over uh, uh, the, the colonies. They would ship that over uh, to Europe. And their response when refrigeration came around was to increase the efficiency of their methods. But it was, we all saw the writing on the wall. This happened with the uh, transistor versus uh, cathode ray tubes. This happened uh, with uh, oil lamps versus uh, electric lights. We see this from industry to industry to industry. And so what we're going to probably see, history repeats itself, is that as large language models begin to be infused in different industries, you're going to see some of this pathological trying to increase efficiency in their own operations as opposed to leveraging or adopting that newer technology. And I think there that's going to be it's going to be a challenging juxtaposition. And we know how that story plays out, that the newer technology, if it proves to be better and if it proves to advance, right, it's going to win out. And so it's interesting to see that because sitting right center place in all of that is higher education. And uh, the response from some schools has been to shut it down. Right? We're going to cut off the IP access. No one gets to use these technologies. There's the other mindset of maybe once you've gotten to a certain point, right, once you're at the collegiate level, we need to focus on understanding how to integrate these technologies and become the drivers of of innovation with these new technologies as opposed to pushing them to the side. I think we're still kind of in this weird quasi space where we're trying to figure out what that is and build in appropriate systems to, to, to support the learning that we're doing. So. Right, and to kind of build on what you said with disruption, you know, everybody got all bent out of shape when the scientific calculator came along, how are we gonna learn math? but everybody adapted and we still learn math. So I think this will ultimately be the same way. There'll just be some growing pains and we'll have to think about it uh, in a responsible way. And I think there are some really important things that, that we in this group here can, can recognize is that we can tell when our chat GPT is coming out with good material. You can say, oh, you know what? I, I read through that, that sounds good because we have that experience and exposure to writing, our understanding of, of writing and production is such that we can quickly validate the results. But but we built up to that level and we have to be very careful with how we leverage these technologies to make sure that, that our students still rise to that level so that they can truly validate as opposed to just hitting the button and accepting what comes out. 
Yeah, it's very interesting all what you're saying. And actually, it calmed me down a little bit because personally, this kind of um, topics like scare me um, because it's like too much. It's too much. And that's why I ask the question about like, if they at what point this is, you know, like interacting as, as human beings and all this. Um, because I feel like there's this tiny little line between how you can use it. So it's amazing how you say like, yeah, I mean, it still work. Like it's going to exist. It's going to continue going. It's being like that in the story. Um, but we can actually use it in a good way. And I think that that's that's amazing because it's a very positive way to see it. And and I think that that's what we are supposed to do. So that's that's very good to know and and to learn and to know that it exists and that to know that we can use it as a good tool and well that that led me to the next question that is how is hood college managing this unique technological challenge i think you've got a good set of folks here because i can speak from the faculty side and, and catherine can speak from the the support side of how uh, the library and, and elsewise are using it. Catherine, I'll let you go first. Um, so I don't know that much about how Hood as an institution is dealing with it. Um, I mean, I know students haven't been using it. It's probably fair to say that they probably use it for their schoolwork. Um, I mean, just, I think in terms of using it and integrating it and having some level of acceptance, I would say that, um, you know, probably professors are going to have to have some kind of chat GPT policy for their class. And they would, it would be in their best interest to let students know they're responsible for their work and they have to verify anything chat GPT produces. They can use it to generate ideas or projects. Um, you could also use chat GPT as a tool and fact check it to kind of underscore the importance of evaluating sources and information. Um, have more in-class discussions, focus more on like the process rather than a final product, you know, so talk about research and generating ideas and all of that, rather than just focusing on, you know, what is this paper, produce a 10-page pa paper, and I'll give you a grade. So it's more of a process now rather than a final product. It's an interesting question, because I think faculty are all over the board with their use and acceptance and understanding of, of this technology. In hallway conversations, I've heard uh, faculty members, some say, absolutely not. You know, my policy is that you will not use this in my class. In other classes, like mine, uh, I actually now have assignments that are specifically focused on leveraging and using generative AI. I think we've got a semester that we can really figure this out. Microsoft is integrating these into Office. And as that happens, they become available to the masses and they become as consistent in use or expectation of use as that red squiggle that underlies when you have a misspelled word. Most faculty that I know don't tell students to turn off that grammar check or that spell check. Of course, back in you know prior to that technology coming online, there were folks that said, "Oh my gosh, people are going to forget how to spell." Well, I haven't improved my spelling much, but certainly the documents I produce have fewer uh, spelling and grammatical errors. I think we're going to figure this out because, and we're going to have to figure this out quickly. I don't think a good response is an as an institution to say no to say, don't use this, don't use this in these certain environments because it's gonna be impossible to enforce and it's gonna be against the standards that the rest of industry uh, are, are going to be adopting. What I think we can, we can do instead is, is both recognize how to, how to support it, recognize how to perhaps even migrate to other methods of assessment or interaction with our students, perhaps that we haven't used as, as much in, in recent years. 
For example, you know, as, as I've crafted an assignment for my class that utilizes generative AI, they have to present that in a stand-up forum. So they have to uh, be in front of an audience and, and talk about both their process and the final uh, results of what they've created. And my suspicion is I'm going to be going towards more of that. I'm going to be going towards more of the you know, direct interaction, uh, spoken interaction. I don't think I'm going to go more towards handwritten communication uh, or, or written out tests, but I, I do see faculty that are beginning to move in that direction as well. So um, those are all on the table for, for how we're going to begin to transition to make sure that we we match this type of new technology, this technology that is going to be impacting every segment of, of interaction. And just to build on what you said, David, um, I think that probably becoming skilled at entering prompts is going to become a skill set in the near future, because what you put in is what you get out. If you have if you have a paper due in an hour and you put in a real terrible prompt, you're going to get a pretty terrible paper out of it. And it's going to be real easy for your professor to spot that. So I think that's going to be a skill set of the future. And maybe some skills are going to fall by the wayside because things are getting, you know, just outsourced across the board. Maybe you don't need to know how to cite in different styles because this could easily do that. Or maybe you don't need to know how to do a literature review because this could also do that pretty easily. So that's you know something to consider. What skills are indispensable and once what skills are kind of banal and they can be taken over by chat GPT and, and the like. Exactly. And you know, I, how many faculty have had conversations saying, did they find that on the internet and copy paste it? Because in many ways, right, that's a, a good analogy to what the end result can look like from a not well prompted uh LLM and a copy paste job from a, a Google. And we have tools, right, that help us to understand that. When students uh, put their work into Blackboard, we have automatic checking systems that uh, examine against uh, prior databases of, of, uh, of student work and of, of broader material on the internet. We will have similar types of tools as well. But I think it all comes back to that recognition that it's not a panacea and a student that doesn't put in the appropriate time and interact with these probably is not going to get the end results that their peers will now do, right? That peers that are that are leveraging these in the appropriate way, they're gonna be up here. And, and that's gonna be now the, the standard that we have to keep. Right, right. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting. I, I learned a lot with you both. Um, to close the conversation, um, we would like you to ask. We would like to ask you a little advice for professors, <laughs> because you know, professors that maybe still using the traditional ways of teaching, or maybe there some professors that don't know about ChatGPT or don't know how to make new assignments and they maybe are worried about cheating in with the students so like a quickly advice from both of you in one or two sentences um yeah so i mean there are tools for detecting plagiarism or ai but i feel like kind of engaging in this gotcha behavior is going to be very exhausting and I don't think it's going to be fruitful and it's basically just an arms race between AI and AI detectors so I think it's going to be more about reassessing your assignments and what how you want to um, grade students in your class I think that's really what it comes down to. Hey, Catherine you're, you're you're spot on with that I think the the best of the systems now have you know, 12 to 15 percent accuracy with being able to detect that and and there are certainly ways of, of reducing that footprint my advice is start using this technology yourselves because as you begin to utilize this technology as you begin to leverage it and, and understand the the places that it works it stands up and other places where you need to have more effort where understanding needs to be addressed you'll be able to do that with your students as well. And so I, 
if you haven't got an account, if you, if you haven't started working on these systems, this is your opportunity. This is your golden ticket to become uh, one of the leaders in this area. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is, uh, I, I am like now so encouraged to also use it and use it as a tool, more like a, something that scared me. Um, thank you so much for, for, for this time and for all the information. And definitely, uh, this is an invitation for everybody to start using technology in a balanced way and in a positive way for improvement. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to A Degree Further, the official podcast of the Graduate School at Hood College, where we help you go further in your life, in your career, and in your community. Be sure to tune in next time and to catch up on all the latest episodes. Visit hood.edu slash a degree further. I'm your host, Mariana, and thank you so much for listening.